my fellow comic book collectors, it's Alan, the Comic Collector Geek, and this is the Wednesday video where I answer your questions. Uh, each week, uh, people ask me the questions the following, the previous week, uh, and then I answer them the following week. So uh, last week, I got a bunch of questions, a lot of questions. I'm going to show some pretty cool things, but before I get into the questions, I actually have to do an update. <laughs> so. On Monday, I, I totally messed up. I, I did a video where I was doing the hottest Silver Age comics of the week, and the auctions hadn't finished. <laughs> it was just a goof on my part. Um, I thought the auctions were going to finish before we actually recorded. They just they were like a few hours out, so uh, we didn't get to see the final prices. But we sort of guessed at what the prices would be. And I'm going to tell you how well I did in terms of guessing. I was off on a lot of them. <laughs> we'll see. But I was pretty, I was, you know, I think I was more right than wrong. Well, let's get into those first, and then I'll get into the questions. So this might be a bit of a longer video. Um, so the first one was uh, Superman's Girlfriend, Lois Lane, number four. Um, it was an 8.5 that uh, sold on Heritage, and it was going for... Um, at the time when we were looking at it, it was only at five hundred dollars, so I was like, "Oh, okay, maybe, um, maybe a thousand. You know, but usually I use this kind of rule of thumb, where it sort of doubles, uh, whatever that kind of just before the auction actually happens price, um, and I was way off. <laughs> this one went really, went really high. Uh, it went to twenty one hundred and sixty dollars. So, uh, so 2,160, so about twice what I thought. Now, when I estimated the, the thousand, actually, I thought that was really low. I thought that was a bit of a steal. Um, so, you know, <laughs> take that with, with what I was saying. So I was thinking it was probably worth more than a thousand, but I thought it maybe would settle at a thousand based on my rule of thumb. Um, the next one was Hawkman, number one, uh, from 1964. It was a, nine four um and at the time i thought it was going to go for around 3500 it went for 3600 so i was pretty close on that one um finally one right <laughs> so that one went for 3600 uh then green lantern number one from 1960 uh it was a seven five and i was estimating that it would go for around four thousand maybe a little less i thought maybe a little less than four thousand it went for a little less than four thousand. It went for thirty-three, uh, went for three thousand three hundred and sixty dollars. So it was kind of around where I expected it to go. Um, then we got uh, Detective Comics three fifty-nine uh, from nineteen sixty-seven, and it was an eight-five that sold. And I thought it would go like I thought it was going to go for around five thousand. Well, it sold for three thousand three hundred and sixty. So that one was a bit of a steal. I was actually really surprised by that one. I thought it was going to go for a lot more. Um, the next one was Adventure Comics 247. Uh, this one, um, I thought it was going to go for around 6600 It went for 6600 Exactly what I predicted. <laughs> uh, the next one was Our Army at War, number 83. Um... Uh, this was from 1959. It was a uh, 6.0, and uh, I was predicting that it would go for around 6,000, maybe a little bit more, 6,200, I guess. Um, it went for 10,800, so I was way off on that. So two that I was way off, Every one, all the other ones I was pretty accurate. Um, so two out of six. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> two out of six wrong. So... Um, Take that with whatever you want to take that. So um, those are the that was the update from Monday's video. So I recommend you check that video. You can see my predictions on that. Um, first question though, let's get into the questions. Uh, the first question comes from Son of Crom, and he asked, "What would you say are the top five grails in all of comics that are unattainable for the regular average collector?" There's probably thousands actually that would fit this. And what would be you? What would you consider your five top five grails uh, in all of comics that are attainable for the regular <laughs> average collector? Okay, so 
the ones that I would say are not attainable first, we'll do those, uh, would be obviously the Superman one, uh, the Detective 27, Marvel one, um, Action one, and, um, so wait, did I, okay, I, either Batman one, okay, so wait, we've got, <laughs> oh, I actually, uh, 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 I would say Captain America. Actually, Batman's actually more affordable than Captain America one. So, so we go with those five. Those would be the five biggest ones. Of uh, the 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 movie funnies one would be another one that might be in that list, but that's just on a table for anybody, <laughs> even if you're rich. It's a pretty hard book to get. Uh, so that would be so Superman one. Detective 27, Action 1, um, Marvel 1, and uh, Captain America 1. So those would be my guesses on that. Uh, in terms of the five grails that are, like, these are the books that I think would be really awesome to get for the average collector um, and that are attainable would be Amazing Fantasy 15. <laughs> I think that's actually attainable. Um, you know, you can probably get in on that book, uh, at the five to $10,000 range. So that's not too bad. Um, another one would be, um, uh, what's it called? Um, X-Men one. So amazing fantasy X-Men. Then it would be like uh, fantastic four. Number one, all of these books you can get for 10,000 or under. Okay. I think most people, if they kind of save up, they can afford ten thousand dollars. You know, it, 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 when I'm saying attainable, it's it's maybe a stretch of one's finances, but they could do it if they really put their minds to it. Um, and the last two would be like um, Tales of Suspense thirty nine, and maybe Journey into Mystery eighty three. So those would be the big ones. Um, there's some others that would like those are all silver age if you want to get into the golden age grails um, Batman one would be kind of a stretch for most people but maybe maybe possible <laughs> maybe um, another one that's sort of a grail would be um, uh, Wonder Woman number one would be kind of attainable that you can get for maybe around that 10,000 mark if it's restored you know there's certain caveats that you could put on it um, where you could probably get an affordable copy um, uh, again with uh, Wonder Woman theme uh, probably like uh, Sensation Comics one kind of in that $10,000 mark um, more fun comics number 55 Again, you can get that under 10,000. So anything under 10,000, I would say, is sort of attainable. Um, again, <laughs> might stretch one's uh, finances, but if you can save up for it, you know, I think you can attain it. Um, that was one thing that I really realized when I got my um, All-Star 8, uh, was that maybe all comics are attainable if you put your mind to it. So um, I didn't think I could ever attain that book. Uh, but then once I did, I realize I could attain a lot of books so um if you put your mind to it um get play payment plans <laughs> always helps too okay uh the next question uh also from the center son of crom is many experts puts little quotes on it so I'll put the little quotes there uh or youtubers I have watched in the last two months said that prices of CGC restored grades are closer to unrestored values when they are at the lower grades and not at the higher grades. That is very true. So at the very tippy top of the grade, like let's say you had a 9.8 blue label versus a 9.8 restored. Well, you're probably going to get maybe a 20th or a 40th of the value. Um, and that's just the way, um, uh, the way, the rule of thumb that kind of people think about when they're looking at restored versus blue is how would the grade be if I remove that restoration, what would the grade be? Now, if it's trimmed, it's a done deal, right? There's there's nothing you can do to untrim a book. Um, but that's that's the the logic. That's the the behind the way most people think. Now, a nine eight, 
if it, if you remove some of the restoration like color touch let's say it's been color touched or something happened where it's been sort of uh you're gonna do lots of damage to the book in order to remove that restoration you might only get like a three <laughs> so so it makes sense there's a logical reason for why um that book would be like a much lower value than a nine eight um but i've seen books that are in ex exceptionally high grade that are actually cheaper than 0.5 which i think is unrealistic but that's part of the market as well um now at the high grades you're going to get that much bigger of a drop from any kind of removal of restoration um at the low grades like a 0.5 restored versus a 0.5 blue label probably not much difference maybe like 90 percent of the value like it's pretty close so that's really the logic you know removing restoration well it's still an incomplete book <laughs> it's you know uh it's not going to make any difference so you'll probably get most of the value out of that blue label versus purple label value um so that's kind of the logic behind it so yes that is the case that uh, restored books in the lower grades kind of a little bit closer to the uh parity on value um next question comes from k munin on your uh, October 21st live stream, you showed Beyond 27. I brought it again. So this is Beyond 27, this book. Okay. And how exactly did the book manage to find its way into the Seduction of the Innocent? So this one is... Actually, they don't mention that Seduction of the Innocent. Usually you'd see it there, but it is part of the Seduction of the Innocent, I'm telling you. Um, uh, well, this one was mentioned in the Seduction of the Innocent because um, immoral violence for the sake of entertainment. A doctor drinks an elixir, turns into a monster, and then proceeds to go on a murder spree. So that's, that was Wortham's logic for why that one was mentioned in The Seduction of the Innocent. Okay, uh, next question comes from I Like What I Buy. Who did the cover for Bruce Gentry number one? So this is Bruce Gentry number one. It's actually a Canadian comic. Um, now, when you look this up, it actually, if you look at the co Grand Comics database, it does not say who did the cover. I think that it has Cayman, like, and this is what Grand, Grand Comics database says as well, is that it has like cover, it looks like almost like a cover swipe of Cayman's Jack Kamen's work the way the woman is drawn especially looks like Jack Kamen's style um almost with Matt Baker hair <laughs> um now this was a superior comic which I believe it's superior or is it four star oh it's a four star now I'm not sure if they use Iger House or one of those ones um but it was probably that it was like um an amalgamation of different artists um, probably like Jack Kamen would be my guess. So, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say because it, it, it's not tracked. A lot of the time in the golden age, a lot of the artists who did the covers, it's not exactly obvious who they were because it was not attributed. Um, but you, you can see certain styles and sort of guess that, oh, it's this artist. And that one definitely looks like Jack Kamen. Um, next question. I could be wrong, but it seems that underground comics of the 60s were, are, aren't super valuable. They must have had a tiny print run compared to the B-list comics of the day, like Charlton. Um, but you can pick up, say, Zap 1 for a decent grade, not for that much. Um... As important and influential underground comics were, why are there so little demand for them? What are your favorite underground comics? In the same theme, what is your opinion of the significant... Okay, I'll get to that in a second, actually. So first, let's deal with this first question. Um, so Zap 1 is an expensive book. <laughs> it's actually like a really expensive book. Uh, probably you thinking that uh, you can get a Zap 1 uh affordably but generally it's not that affordable because uh, there was many many printings of it so sometimes you can get a second or third or fourth printing 
I think there's like 15 printings of it. Um, yeah, the later printings were are pretty cheap. Uh, but first printing of Zap One goes for about two thousand dollars. It's not a it's not a cheap book. I do see it coming up at auction once in a while, but it is it is generally a pretty pricey book. Um, now most of the underground comics kind of are affordable for what they are. Uh, they they suffer that a lot of the time they are that multiple printings. Um, I think a lot of the time they had low printings on the first print and then they would just kind of massively produce them. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that lowers the overall price because there are that multiple printings. Um, and so they, they appear to be more common than they really are. Uh, also, underground comics are not... Um, they are a niche within the comic collecting sphere that not many people actually go out and uh, go after uh, underground comics. And a lot of them dealt with adult issues where a lot of comic collectors might kind of steer away from that. Actually, I had somebody who sold me their adult uh, underground comics collection for almost like pennies on the dollar. It was like really cheap because they didn't want to have those kind of books in their home. So that's another negative thing that goes with these um, underground comics that they a little bit adult and some people don't really feel comfortable having them in their homes. Um, now, the next question, uh, at the same, on the same theme, in your opinion, is there a significant difference between uh, the, the underground comics by creators like uh, Crumb in Spain and the later indie comic scene with creators like Hernandez Brothers, Love and Rockets, uh, Daniel Klaus and with Eight Ball. Okay, Klaus with Eight Ball. Um, so very different. Um, so the underground comics of the '60s and '70s were really books that were rebelling against um, the Comic Code Authority. So they were very drug orientated. They were more. Um, sexual avert, uh, overtly sexual in their nature uh racial in their nature like 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 if you look at some of like uh robert crumb stuff it was overtly racist <laughs> overtly racist and it really wanted to be it, it intended to be not because it, it was anti whatever um but it intended to be just because that was something that was in the comic code that they were trying to rebel against uh the the norms of society and that was really the theme of um the underground comics now if you move forward and you look at like uh love and rockets and all those ones they are not real they're they're more about addressing uh a, maybe a marginalized group in society love and rockets maybe with the gay and lesbian society and um <laughs> You know, they were looking at sort of these marginalized groups, like these groups that were not kind of the mainstream groups within society and really telling their stories. So it's a little different uh, mindset between the two. Um, but uh, both are kind of like the indie, indie version of comics, that these are not the mainstream comics in general. Um, but just different attitudes. Uh, the attitudes had very much changed by the time those independent books of the 80s had come out because, um, but the groundwork had been set for them to kind of have that kind of like independent uh, sort of separate market even uh, than the mainstream comics. And another thing that the, the independent comics of the 80s really was trying to do um, was really write stories that weren't superheroes. <laughs> that, was, that was another big thing. They really wanted to be uh, different from what the mainstream comic companies were producing. Um, so those are some of the themes there. Okay, uh, Troy Evans wrote, How can you find out information on print run numbers on comic issues? Is there a website that provides print run amounts on the Golden Age? No. So there's nothing for the Golden Age. The Golden Age, pretty much a black box. You don't know what <laughs> what the values were or the, the print runs were for those books. Generally, uh, it's assumed that they're in the hundreds of thousands to millions. Okay. 
Um, like for example, Superman one had a print run of about a million comics. Um, but, and a lot of the Fawcett books were in the round that million print run, um, uh, numbers. So it's not really known though. <laughs> it's not really known. Uh, a lot of the print runs, it's just lost to history. Uh, however, uh, there's a site called Chromicron and it's spelled C O M. I C H R O N dot com. Okay, I'll link, I'll put the link in the description. Uh, you can check that site out and it gives like Silver Age to modern print runs. So you can find out how many, um, whatever book it was, was printed. Um, I actually think it even gives the returns. So a lot of the time when um, you see a print run, like let's say, like some book from the 60s, uh, you think, oh, it's, got hundred thousand of them out there and but actually that number is not true because a lot of the books were going to the newsstand and then getting returned and the return rates were actually quite high um, a lot of DC books had return rates of anywhere from 50 to 80 percent like really high return rates so the number even though the print run was fairly big uh, the number of books that actually survived in terms of actually just being out in the public was actually quite low because a lot of them were being returned by the newsstands with, you know, remainder copies. So, um, Chromacron gives you that kind of information where you can find out, um, what the print runs of comics from the Silver Age up till now. So a very useful site. Okay. M. LeBlonde wrote, uh, could you, uh, show some comics that you bought for cheap and, um, and ones that you bought for cover price that are now worth a lot. Um, so I'm going to show you one that I bought for cover price. Um, it's a Scud. <laughs> um, mine actually needs to be pressed. I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh man, I didn't realize it, it, it got kind of mangled uh, over the years being in the, in the, the box. Uh, but this was mint when I bought it. <laughs> I bought it a cover price. Uh, actually slightly lower than cover price because um, I bought the, a collection uh, somebody had at the time when this came out. I bought the whole run. Um, I think I paid like 10 bucks for the whole run. Uh, this one's now worth around 100 bucks, I think. Um, another one that I got, and I got this for a Christmas present, I got it in the three pack, uh, is Uncle Scrooge. And even though this one, you can tell, like, I was not nice to my comics as a kid. Look, you know, look at the spine ticks. It's a little rough. Uh, this one goes for about four or $500 because it's a rare, uh, it's just an incredibly rare book. Uh, just very low print run. Um, it was only available in Canada. It was only available in the, the three packs. And as a result, it's just an incredibly rare book. Um, but I just happened to have it. Uh, I got it literally for... 40 cents I think it was less than that because a three pack I think they would charge a dollar <laughs> and then you get one well, basically you get three books for the price of a dollar so it's actually less than cover price um, but those are some examples of it um, some other books I didn't bring them because I couldn't find them they're somewhere lost in my collection um, <laughs> were uh, Dracula number one I picked that up in the dollar bin uh, mine's a pretty low grade I'd say like a three um, but a Dracula number one, uh, I paid two dollars, I think, for it. Um, another book was Voltron. I think I paid a dollar or two for that. Uh, Mighty Morphing Power Rangers. I think I paid a dollar or two for that. <laughs> like those are books that I found in the dollar bin and way back this is back in the nineties when they weren't as valuable as they are now. Um, they're all those ones, the Voltron and the Mighty Morphing Power Rangers were they're mint. They're beautiful copies. Um, but I got them for like a dollar or two. Um, yeah, so a bunch of books. Uh, pretty much anything that is valuable from the 90s, I probably picked up off the cover, off the shelf. Um, I even, like, I had the complete run of Sandman. <laughs> I always harp on that, um, because I, I, and I bought them all, almost all of them for cover. Um, and then... Now, but then I sold them because of my wife, but uh, I sold them much more than cover price. So I did make money on them, uh, but now they would be worth a lot more. So 
you know, um, and there was actually a book recently that dropped called Monsters, number one. Uh, I picked up the Frankenstein cover where it's the Lady Frankenstein. Uh, that's going for like 60 to $70. I was shocked. <laughs> uh, I bought that for cover price. So, so you can still, you can still win on certain books that are just coming out even. Okay. Uh, next question comes from, uh, Sean Magian. And hopefully that's right. Why was there a trade embargo between U.S. and Canada? Was was this only prior to December seventh, nineteen forty seven? Because America was not at war in uh, not in war World War Two yet, but Canada was part of the Commonwealth. Okay, so what happened was um, we had the War uh, Wars Measured Act, Measures Act. And basically, um, it was the War Exchange Conservation, Conservation Act, which came into play in December of 1940. And really what this act was done was it banned all non-essential imports, including comic books, in this, in, to support the war economy. In March of 1941, Vernon Miller, through his Maple Leaf distribution in publishing in Vancouver published Canada's first homegrown comic book, Better Comics Number no. 1. By 1942, uh, four publishers started producing comics, Maple Leaf in Vancouver, Bell Features in Toronto, Anglo-American Anglo in Toronto, and Education Projects in Montreal. Um, by 1947, though, the Wars Measures Act, the War Exchange Conservation Act was removed. Um, and by 1948, though, again, at, at the end of 1947, 1948, it actually, they had an emergency act, and then it came into play for another few years after that. So, so it basically, they sort of brought it back, realizing that uh, because were, the Canadian economy was kind of overwhelmed by American products uh, in 1947, so they kind of brought it back in. But the, the act actually eliminate like, it didn't just hit comics. It was everything from umbrellas to uh, different random things that, that were produced in the U.S. that we couldn't produce cheaper in Canada. So basically, the goal of the act was really to protect the local Canadian economy, local producers, uh, so that they would have... Um, you know, money being created while we were funding the war. Um, the war was really putting a lot of strain on Canada. Canada was a young nation at the time. Um, and really, uh, the war was very expensive. Uh, we racked up a huge debt <laughs> during the, the war, uh, the Second World War. Um, and this was a way to try to boost the Canadian economy by basically blockading uh, U.S. goods into Canada. Um, I'm not sure, like, I actually thought it went both ways, where Canada not only would not allow U.S. imports, but also would, um, correspondingly not let Canadian exports. I'm not sure if that's the case. I, I, I haven't been able to confirm that, to tell you the truth. So I thought, for example, um, Superior Comics, I, I, I might have been mistaken when I said that those books were not to, allowed to be sold into the U.S. I'm not sure if that's the case, actually. Based on what I was reading, uh, I'm not really sure. I'm, so somebody can tell me in the comments, answer my question in a way, was it a both-way thing with comics that you Canadian publishers were not allowed to publish into the U.S.? I don't, I'm not sure. So I'd like to hear an answer about that. Um, uh, Matt Likes Comics wrote, as a follow-up, um, how rare are superior comics? So this is kind of related to the previous question. Uh, is eBay the best place to find them? Uh, eBay is the best place to find them. Um, when you find them, negotiate. So the way it works is, um, if you look at the census on um, superior comics, which produced uh, titles like uh, Love and Marriage, uh, Strange Mysteries, a whole bunch of cool titles, um, romance and horror and sci-fi and everything. They produced a lot of stuff. Um, you will find that uh, the census counts are really low. 
on the romance stuff less than 10 like on the census um for the for the horror maybe 20 to 30 in terms of the census and a lot of that the reason for that is not that it's necessarily as rare as people might think um it is due to the fact that there's not enough value there so uh generally the romance books go for anywhere from 30 all the way up to a few hundred dollars depending on grade i mean that's standard um so there's not enough value there for people to get those graded because grading golden age comics is more expensive so generally if you have those superior comics you're not going to get them graded because there's just not enough value in getting them graded so um that's why the low census counts but they are still rare i'm not saying that they're not rare <laughs> they are harder to find um and there are certain issues like it's not really because the census isn't there yet where you know enough of books been graded yet to really figure it out and um they are um uh, they're just not it's not known how rare they really are and it's there's not enough demand because people just don't know about them uh for people to start pulling them out of their their attics and whatever to have them hit the market so really what we, we it's a un, very unknown space I have a feeling that they're super rare um, because they were produced in Canada. Um, they were printed in Canada. Um, they were intended for the Canadian market, but also kind of snuck over to the U.S. market. Uh, so it's one of those things where we don't really know how rare it is and, until it gets more established. Uh, if the prices start going up, we'll, we'll learn very quickly <laughs> how rare they really are. Um, but right now they're fairly affordable. It's one of those things that I've been specking on because I enjoy the covers, I enjoy the stories because they're 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 really fun stuff. Uh, Superior comics, very underrated. Um, so yeah, but uh, go on eBay, you can find them fairly easily. Uh, Hazu wrote, "What do you think about incentive variance and ratio variance? Which which interesting incentive variance?" do you have will they likely gain value or lose value okay so what do i think about them um generally it's all about the cover at the end of the day that's really all the incentive ratio variants are uh, now there's a couple things that i have to add as caveats to that sometimes the ratios will have a cover that like let's say there's a first appearance in a comic but then the ratio has like the uh, the cover that shows that first appearance. A good example is Spider Boy when he made his first appearance. It was the ratio variant that had <laughs> that had the the first cover appearance of the character. So those ones generally will hold their value a bit better, and if depending on how successful that character is, and generally will go up. A lot of the time, though, out of the gate. Um, People get excited about ratios and incentives, but over time, they don't necessarily hold their value. Um, you really need to see how much they jump up before you can say, oh, they're really, uh, they're gonna, there's gonna be something there long term. Um, another thing is you have to consider how well were these books ordered in the first place. So incentive variants are generally ones where, um, let's say a, a comic, uh, like store orders 10 books they might get one they'll get one ratio variant as a bonus so as a thank you they'll get a ratio variant of one of 10 now if they order 25 they might get a one in 25 variant if they order 100 books they might get a one in 100 okay and there's even one in 200 so there's some really very strict ratios where you'd have to order a lot of books to get it now, generally, most comic shops, uh, in certain titles, they will not, <laughs> they will not order enough to merit getting even one ratio variant. Um, however, there's big, uh, like uh, comic um, companies that will generally order thousands of books. Like they will actually order. Like if you look at my comic shop, Ding, Ding. <laughs> um, they will order a lot of books and they will generally get all those incentive ratios. 
so yeah, so you gotta think about that. So one I'm gonna show, I'm just gonna grab it here, sorry, is this one. This is a retailer incentive variant. So uh, this is Popeye. And as a result, nobody ordered Popeye. <laughs> Popeye is not like a popular title. Um, so this one, as a result, had very low ordering. It just, nobody ordered it. Uh, and you had to order, I think, at least 25 to get it. So, you know, we're talking like, there's probably maybe 300, 200 of these produced. Uh, very rare, uh, maybe even less than that. I don't know, very low number of these produced. And as a result, it's quite rare and goes for a lot of money. Uh, in a 9.8, it goes for 1500 to $2,000. Just a crazy, crazy price for for a uh, modern book. Uh, it's one that I really like. Um, and again, it's all about the cover, buying that cover that you like. Um, so a lot of those Popeye ones are probably good investments because they are rare. And if people, you know, uh, say, hey, those are pretty cool covers, then they will generally go up in value. Um, uh, but for the most part, you got to be really careful with ratio variants because um, uh, they <laughs> don't necessarily perform as well as people might think. Um, they get a lot of hype at the beginning, and then once you know all that hype ends, they generally drop in value. I recommend always look at comics um, may maybe six months later. Um, don't get sucked up in that initial hype because the prices will go really crazy. So generally what will end up happening is you get the, the typical capitalist thing where, um, you know, uh, a few people will have, you know, copies available. They'll put them up on the thing, uh, up on eBay or whatever. The prices will go crazy. Uh, those few people that were quick about getting their book up onto the, on eBay uh, generally will do well. They'll get pretty high price. And then uh, if there's a lot of hype around it. Other people will kind of flood the market with their copies. And what you'll have is then the price corrects. It goes down because there's more supply than demand. Um, so generally that's what will happen. Uh, so that's why I say, you know, either get it right at the beginning before it actually hits those hot lists or uh, generally um, wait six months and you'll find that the price dropped. It might go back up. It might continue to go up if it's a really cool one, but that's less likely than you might think. <laughs> it's, it has to be really cool. Uh, there are a few that are like that, though. Um, but it's really looking at what do you think the the number of stores that would have ordered that book would be? Um, how cool of a cover is it? And does it feature maybe a first appearance that's only on that incentive? Those are kind of things that you got to think about at the back of your head. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps. Uh, last question. And this one is from James Green. Do you collect anything other than comics? I'd love to see your figures, art, or anything else. Um, so I do collect original art. Um, not much. I have a bit. I do, I get a few commissions. Um, but I'm going to show you some pops and figures. Uh, I actually collect coins, stamps, um, and some other things, <laughs> teddy bears and stuff, I don't know, I will, and little figurines and stuff. But I'm going to show you uh, my little Vampirella figure. This is uh, from Aurora. Uh, this was offered at the back of Warren Publishing magazines. And even has the little bat. bat. And this one I got professionally uh, painted. Normally it would be just all like this color. So this one's professionally painted. Okay, and I have a whole bunch of Funko Pops. So here's my exclusive Wonder Woman one, Glow in the Dark. So if you like Glow in the Dark Wonder Woman, that's one. Then we got Modoc. <laughs> It's another little exclusive. It even, I even have it in the special case. And we got Spider-Man. I don't know how much these are worth. I don't really collect them as like where I know the values and stuff. But um, 
I do like them. I do like Funkos. And then we got um, uh, Quicksilver, Pedro, Maximov, and we got some a kid Loki. And one sec here. We got Thor, another glow in the dark. We should test these out really. And it's a convention exclusive. And then we have Adam Warlock. And I have a bunch, I have a bunch of pops actually. So these are just a few. Uh, some samples of the ones that I have. I have a ton of uh, pops. Um, um, but most of them have been stolen by my kids. <laughs> or I steal them. I steal some of their pops too. So it balances out. Um, so yeah. So those are um, some of my collection. Uh, the original art. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can show some original art. Just quickly I'll show a little bit of original art. Um, just because have your attention so here's some original art that i picked up i really like this artist and i thought this was really cool and i got some commission artwork from him as well so yeah so, so that's some of the original art i have a ton of original art as well um but uh some of it is not really meant for youtube <laughs> it's, not, it's not quite appropriate so if you have a question you want answered put it in the comments below and i will do my best to answer it thanks again for watching bye for now